Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to uh, today's uh, open Q&A session um, called Ramadan Refresher. Um, basically, it's an open Q&A session for uh, virtues of the month, uh, moon sighting, if, do's and don'ts, or any other Ramadan, uh, and maybe the need related questions. Um, so let's start right off. Does anybody have questions from the audience for Brother Asim Kazi? So the first question is uh, for praying Salah and doing calculation. But uh, why can't we do calculation for a moon sighting? Okay. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Um, Jazakallah khair for the question that you asked. Uh, it's, uh, it's a question that uh, many people have and uh, they fail to get some time the, the clarity on the subject. They fail to get the clarity on the subject and uh, they get confused more and um, go in the direction of if we can use a calculation for Salah, why can't we use as a calculation for moon sighting as well? And um, if the, the, there is no clear answer, then of course that becomes uh, a problem. And hence you may conclude, end up concluding that, well, if we can do calculation for one, we can do the calculation for other as well. Now, when it comes to fasting, uh, there are many commands from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and from Allah Azza wa Jal as well regarding sighting of the moon. And uh, inshallah, um, we can talk about in detail about uh, each one if there are questions, but at least let's start with uh, the question that you're asking regarding the issue of calculation for uh, for, for Salah is valid, and while scholars say that it's in, invalid for the moon sighting. When it comes to the Salah, uh, for, for the fasting, and it's not only fasting, as a matter of fact, for the beginning of any month, there are commands that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has, has given to us. And when we say Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we should remember that, that this is part of the wahi from Allah Azza wa Jalla. He does not say things from his own mind. Whatever he says, he's saying it from the wahi, from the revelation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, he says what has been given to him as a wahi. He does not say from his own desires. That's just sort of meaning of the ayah. And now when it comes to the fasting, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, and this hadith has been reported by Muttafaqun alayhi hadith, which means reported by both Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their Sahihain. The hadith says, Sumu li ruyatihi wa aftiru li ruyatihi. Fa in humma alaykum fa akmilu aidatan sha'bana thalatin. The hadith says that fast, sumu li ruyatihi, when you see it. And ru'ya here is from, the, for, from your eyes to see something. And uh, break your fast, it was referring to that you end your fasting of the month of Ramadan. Because the hadith continues, continues on and it says that uh, meaning if it is cloudy on you, meaning you cannot see the moon for whatsoever reason that is preventing you to sight the moon. In that case, the, hadith, the, the command says فَكْمِلُوا the complete idata شَعْبَان thalatin, meaning that you complete the 30 days of the month of Sha'ban. Okay. And the other wording says, which means that if you, it is, you're not able to see because of it's cloudy or whatsoever reason, the rain, uh, then in that case, it says you complete your 30 days of fasting. Okay, so that's the case about the hadith that says about that you have to do that. Now, when it comes to the issue of calculation, there are there's a clear hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that actually talks about the subject, subject of calculation. The hadith says, inna ummatun ummiyah, that, that we are the unlettered nation. Unlettered nation, and that explains, la naktubu wa la tahsabu. We do not write and we do not calculate. 
الشهر هكذا وهكذا وهكذا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم did this way he opened his hands two times and third times he could close one of the thumbs and make it 29 and that's what, and he said like this one two and three so it's 29 days or 30 days so what with the uh, uh, this is how he said it now the question that people bring it up and they say that what it means by that is that we were unlettered nation at that time and today we have become lettered we have become educated we know how to calculate we know how to write hence now from now on we can do the calculation because they look at this hadith as if there's an illa there illa means there's a reason behind the hukum and the problem here is first of all it is not illa and why we are saying it's not illa because number one Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself commanded the Sahaba when it comes to writing the Quran. He had specific people around him. We call them as transcribers of the Quran or katibin al-wahi. They were the ones who were writing the wahi. And then similarly, Sahaba used to write the Quran, the one who were commanded, and the one who were not commanded, they used to write as well. And there were Sahaba who write, used to write the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. So one thing that I always like to remind all, especially the youth, so they have a clarity on the subject. The whole Quran was written, even though it's not for the subject we're discussing, but this should be taken from, us, from, from here, inshallah. The whole Quran was written in the, under the supervision of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to dictate the Quran to the Sahaba and make sure that what is written is correctly written. And he used to tell the Sahaba that which ayah will go in which chapter, okay, which place it will go before or after certain ayah. Now, this is how the Quran was written. So to say that, that we do not know how to write, no, Sahaba knew how to write. Yes, but the Arabs in general, in general, the Arab nation, they were unlettered. They did not know how to read and write. So that, that people who knew how to read and write were not that many. But they were there, people, people, you do read and write. But the nation was referred as the unlettered nation. That's number one thing. Second thing about when it comes to, to Nahsubu, uh, about Hisab, about calculation. Even in Islam, in the time of Rasulullah, we know that calculation is very closely connected to many acts of ibadat and actions that we undertake in our lives. Like for example, zakah needs to be calculated and there are different ways of collecting, uh, uh, calculating the zakah. There's a, there's a nisab that has to be reached there and after that you take 2.5% uh, and depending on what you are taking it out, it's animals or, or, or goods or inventory or, or it's a uh, produce of the land which is, then you take the ashur on it. And so this is a zakah only. And then if you look at the laws of viratha or the inheritance, that are actually pretty complicated. There's a lot of uh, uh, fractions that you have to use. And uh, they become more and more complicated that you have to multiply, and you, have to, uh, you have to keep dividing into parts so you can give certain parts to certain people, whether it's the son or the grandson or, 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 or mother or father or whoever is the inheritor, then you have to uh, divide the wealth in a certain manner. So calculation, just to say, was always part of Islam in general. So in this case, the hadith is actually talking about a specific action where the calculation was, uh, Muslims were prevented to do the calculation to say that the month can start a certain time or other time, right? So th th that's the idea, number one, to understand that there's a rule, there's a hukum regarding the subject. That's why we are saying that. Now, Going to the question that was asked, so what about Salah then? We are calculating for Salah. The reason we say that we cannot calculate when it comes to, uh, comes to fast, uh, fasting or any month that we are calculating when it starts and ends because there, are, there is a hukum regarding that. Now, another aspect to remember about that is it's not only that we are talking about that we cannot, uh, we can, as it was said that, okay, now we are lettered, now we are, uh, uh, we know how to read and write and calculate, then hence we can go ahead and uh, 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 now we can calculate for the sighting. Look, there are many ahkam like this in the Quran that exists. For example, 
Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, la ta'kulu riba ada'afan muda'afa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that do not, or oh, you who believe, do not eat riba, double or multiplied. Now, if we just take this ayah out of isolation, then it sounds like as if that if the riba is less than double, then it's fine. But the issue is not that there's the other hukum that says, Allah has, has made the bay'ah, which is the trade, halal, and riba haram in an absolute term. It's no more the double or multiplied is haram. Rather, any kind of riba is made haram. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, so what it means by that is that other hukum, actually suspends the other hukum now about double and multiply. Now, similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not kill your children out of uh, fear of poverty. Now, in this case, when Allah is talking about that the poverty is the reason, it's not because now, okay, so now can we say that if you are wealthy, then go ahead and just kill your children because you have enough wealth? Nobody says that. Because the other hukum, when they say, وَمَنْ يُقْتَلُ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا وَمَنْ يَقْتُلُ وَمَنْ يَقْتُلْ مُؤْمِنًا مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّ مُخَالِدًا فِيهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, whosoever kills a believer in a amadan, uh, meaning intentionally, then his place is in the hellfire. So this hukum actually suspends the part about whether you're rich or you're poor in all the cases haram. The reason in both cases when you talk about riba, or we're talking about killing your children, these were the norms that existed among the Arabs. What, was, what, what were the norms? One norm was they, were chill, they, they used to kill, bury their daughters alive, for example, out of poverty, or kill their children. Now, similarly, riba was like a double or multiplied time. So those norms were mentioned. Same way when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the norm of the Arabs are unlettered people. Not talking about that, that means that if those things do not exist, then the hukum uh, is okay. No, because the other rulings that come and they suspend that kind of a uh, thinking that it may be that the other way around is around, uh, allowed. No, it's not allowed. Okay, now, so understanding this, why we are saying the calculation for citing is not allowed, let's talk about the salah. When we talk about salah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, about the salah, actually there are ahkam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what means by that is perform the salah from midday and the, uh, uh, from midday till the darkness. Okay. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the timing of the salah is connected to the sun, the movement of the sun. Allah is not saying that you have to see it here compared to when we talk about the moon sighting. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the, 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 that when the sun declines, then you pray. So again, here is just talking about the movement of the sun. And hence, we are aware of, we can calculate, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not restrict it to sighting, and it is left to us that we can find out this by any means, whether it's by looking at the shadow, or by looking at the, by doing the calculation of, uh, of the movement of the sun, or we know, we are aware of how the sun moves, then that's sufficient for us. Hence, for the salah, it is said that it is allowed because that there's no restrictions available from the nas. Well, when it comes to the sighting of the moon, there is a very clear uh, uh, nas that exists that prevents us, that prohibits us to, uh, to start the, the sun by calculation. Okay, I hope that uh, clarifies what you were asking for. Yeah, and I would say that um, you know even the Arabs of the time definitely knew when the month was going to start. They they would know the dates. I mean, they knew how to navigate through the stars. Yes. Uh, so it's not like they wouldn't know that the month is starting. So the fact that it's explicitly talking about seeing the the moon mm -hmm. uh, that kind of overrides. Yeah, so when we talk about this al uh, al falaki or the calculations that we use, uh, this itself, when the hadith is saying that do not do the calculation, that itself means calculation existed. So it's not that calculation did not exist. So to say that 
people did not know how to calculate that itself is false. It's more of a, the hukum is do not do the calculation. And when it comes to the hukum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something, we have to obey, we have to do samayna wa ta'ana. It's not the one we are looking for a loophole to go around the hukum. So the hukum is for us to cite. That's one aspect. Jazakallah khair for bringing that up about not only that the new second, if the people who are, uh, who have been to deserts, they would know that desert is not much different than sea actually to a certain extent. When you are in the middle of the desert, you cannot see anything. And this is why you see mirage sometime and thinking oh, it's water there <laughs> and there is none. So uh, uh, similarly, in the, in, when you're in the middle of the sea, you can't tell your direction except when you have the know-how of the movement of the stars. And from there, you, you, you can tell which direction to go. So yet they were aware of it. They were moving around in the desert. Uh, so, so they knew how to calculate. It's just the hukum was not to calculate. Hence, we don't calculate in that case. While when it comes to salah, it was left to the people whether they want to calculate or not, whichever mean they can use to figure out the time of the salah, and it's allowed. I will explain. Okay, so the brother, the question is about if we can do the qiyas uh, between the salah and the suyam. Uh, qiyas is, uh, if you want to consider it as, it's, a, uh, it's an analogy, and there's a hukum that exists, and if the illa exists in the hukum, then you can apply to the parallel hukums in which that illa exists. So when we talk about the ibadat, in the cases of the ibadat, there is no illa. In the case of ibadah, any, and when we say ibadah, of course, in general, every act of us as Muslims is an act of ibadah. But in the fiqh, when we say act of ibadah, they, uh, they divide the action into three categories. One is considered as a re uh, relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal directly, which is the ibadah, even though the other, other actions are also part of the ibadah, but they are called, for example, mu'amulat. So how you deal with the people around you. So that's the second kind of transactions that you do with the people. Third kind of actions, which are the akhlaq and malbusat and matumat. This is your action with yourself. Whether you are an honest person, the way you dress and uh, you, you do not cheat and uh, you, uh, that kind of thing that you, you don't lie. These things are coming under. This is your actions to yourself right now, right? Now, in the case of the first category, which is called ibadat. In that category, there is no illa. We cannot make a reason about ibadah that this is why the hukum was given. Okay? Because when you say illa, illa means a reason behind the hukum. And the reason behind the hukum can only come from the nas, from the text. We cannot make up the reasons from our own mind. Okay? Unless Allah Azza wa has given a reason in a hukum, we cannot make it up, and that reason has to be coming from the text, and there has to be indicators that the Qarina is there that tells us, oh, this is the reason behind the ruling. Hence, then you can do it. When it comes to ibadah, there is none. Hence, when it comes to salah and, and suyam, we understand these are ibadah. So we cannot make uh, uh, analogy here in these two things. Similarly, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, even though this is not question asked yet, but just to, be, uh, uh, just to talk about it in general anyways, when we talk about that suyam is an obligation, yeah? when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yeah, kama ala min qablikum, that, oh, you who believe that we have prescribed to you fasting, and as we prescribe to the people before you, perhaps you get gained the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal here. Now, we don't make up the reasons now, from our own mind, oh, we fast because so we can feel the pain of the poor, or we fast because uh, this way we can lose some weight, or we can do detoxication of whatever the word is used, yeah? Detox? Detox. Uh, detoxification, okay. So uh, you wanna cleanse your, all the intestines and whatsoever. Now, um, look, the, the, many of those things may become uh, the benefits that you can gain out of it. But they're not the reason, because if that's the case, then fasting would not be obligatory on the poor people. Fasting may not be obligatory on the people who are completely fit. And they, all the, they have they done the detoxification <laughs> prior to the month of Ramadan. So they were already good. So they don't have to do, worry about that, right? 
So uh, hence, we don't make up the illah from our own mind. Yeah? Yes. Uh, two questions. Number one, uh, is the hukam on citing the moon specific to Ramadan, or does it apply to the other Islamic months? So uh, it, it does apply to all the months. As a matter of fact, you can see that a hadith actually uh, not talking about only Ramadan, it talks about Shaban also. And it talks about he was trying to cite the moon of the Shawwal. So even though we are talking about Ramadan here for fasting, we are talking about the, citing the moon of the Shaban and citing the moon of the Shawwal as well. And then for the Hajj as well. So in, in general, the month is, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that in the Quran also, when it says, Yasaluna ga'adil al that they ask about, uh, uh, about the Hilal, for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about that. These are the signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for counting the days. For, for, and that can be used for the Hajj, that can be used for the Umrah, not the Umrah, but the Hajj, uh, when it comes to our Eid, Eid al-Adha, uh, and it goes beyond just the Ibadat, by the way, even for Mu'amalat, even for the Mu'amalat. When we are talking about counting the months, it can be sometimes used for, for example, in the case of uh, uh, a woman whose uh, uh, husband died. In that case, she has to count the number of days for the Iddah. Or uh, if you have made some contracts about you are going to follow certain month, of month or you say that, okay, I am going to make a payment after a certain number of months. So when we are talking about that certain number of months, you have to count those days as well, the months as well. Or when you say, I'm going to make a payment in this month or that month. So in all those cases, you have to, you have to know your months. And when it comes to how to do it, so the hukum applies to all the months that you have to do the ru'ya, you have to do the sighting for the moon, and to say, unfortunately, the ummah only worries about at that time, many a time, that when the month of Ramadan is coming, or month of, uh, for the hajj, month for the hajj is coming. But it applies to all. Is it possible that... Um... From year to year, the number of days will end up being different? See, it, 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 uh, first of all, it, uh, the hadith are very clear that number of days in a month are 29 or 30 days. It cannot be more. So it's not that if, for example, you did not cite the moon for 29, now you are trying to cite for the moon for 30 as well. So no, you did not cite the moon, days become 30 and you move forward. So there's no way that they can be, uh, you can be way off from the months. And again, you start citing the moon. And if, let's say for whatsoever reason, that uh, uh, it does not really happen, but if you are following this rule, it will not, it will not happen what you are looking for. Because you will always limit the number of days in a month to 30 is a max. You cannot have 28 and you cannot have 31. It's either 29 or 30. I don't see it a reason, especially, especially, it cannot happen when we look at it from the perspective of global sighting. If we start looking at it from the perspective of try to regionalize it or uh, start moving the date lines and stuff like that, then you may end up with somebody will fall behind or somebody will move forward. And then in that, in that case, it, mean, it would mean that they have missed a pass or missed a day that they have to make up. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, we have two questions from the district side. The first one is Is there a deadline for making up this fast for women? Okay. So there are, uh, Fuqaha have uh, ikhtilaf in this issue. Um, that uh, Malik, Hanbal, and Shafi, their opinion about that is they should fast in the same year when they have missed. And if they do not do that, in that case, they still, those fasts are due on them, but they have to do the uh, fidya or kafara for that. They have to do the kafara, give the kafara on top of they will be fasting because they have missed a year. And the others, fuqaha say that they, uh, they still have to fast. They can make it up the, the, the following year, but it's going to keep piling up. <laughs> so it's better to just do it the year that you have missed. So there's, a, as I'm saying, there's a ikhtilaf about this issue. It's not one opinion, but either way, you have to complete, right? Now, there's a, there's, there's a difference of opinion about what kind of a fast that they have missed. It's not the issue of just missed, because when we talk about the women, they could be missing the fast because of the haid, for example, which is the menstruation period, 
or uh, nifas uh, or they have nifas is uh, post po, uh, postnatal post birth what is it called yeah yeah postnatal post, yeah. huh post post birth whatever that is uh, so it's called nifas that after you give the birth to the to, to the baby uh, and the bleeding uh, the, the amount of time it goes on at that time you cannot fast either so uh, the, that's one as one kind of fasting we're talking about there's another kind that's called that if they when the while the woman is pregnant and she uh, by the way even if she's pregnant she is supposed to fast but if that becomes a problem for her for or her own health or the baby's health in that case then she is allowed not to fast okay and then in, uh, that's one aspect of it then another one is uh, if she's uh, nursing the child and it becomes a problem for her to uh, fast for example during that time then uh, she is allowed not to fast at time also now the ahkam are, are different for that reason because now fuqaha they differ in these states for example uh, they look at some of them they look at as a sickness that you are bearing a child and uh, you are sick that uh, uh, hence you cannot fast or oh, same thing about the nursing then you have, they, they consider as a sick woman then in that case they say that the rule of a sick person applies on them the one who look at them as this is a hardship that they cannot bear in the sense of uh, old person who does not have the capability of fasting right so the one who take look at from that angle they come up with a different kind of a uh, ruling of, of the kafara and the third category is that says that you are uh, you are both <laughs> you are sick and you cannot bear the, the this the, this hardship so the one who think of both they apply both the kafara which means that they have to do the fast and they have to give the fidya the one who thinks it's just a hardship that the person cannot perform at that at that time at all hence they will just give the fidya and he's good to go and the one who consider that is a sickness then in that case they look at it as he has to just redo the fast so now nah. which want to follow this is uh, I, i'm not going to get into this whole issue of which one to pick and choose here uh, uh, i'm not giving for others but uh, the, the, uh, i would just leave it for right now as is if you want to talk personally we can talk about later listen there are different madhab yes it is a, it is a madhab issue and if a, a person is following certain madhab then he should stick with the uh, i mean in the specific action for sure that the specific uh, hukum that we are discussing i'm not trying to say here a person is following one madhab so he has to stick with one madhab this is not what i'm saying as a whole as a whole, one madhab even though there are some fuqaha they go into this discussion of that uh, a person has to follow the same madhab for every ruling i'm talking about from the perspective of one uh, specific uh, uh, hukum from the hukum perspective the person is following for example shafi or hanafi or maliki or hanbali whichever scholar uh, a madhab he's following he or she is following then you stick with that for the specific hukum and it comes to fasting for example right so now about the both uh, the jurists have four different opinions uh, actually not three i mentioned okay so ibn umar and ibn abbas they say about the qada of the pregnant and nursing woman so hayd is clear hayd is you have to fast okay um, now uh, hayd is uh, menstruation by the way sorry uh, now when it comes to pre- pregnant women and nursing so ibn umar and ibn abbas their opinion is both both feed the needy and there is no qada so they say you just feed the needy and you good both is referring to the pregnant woman and nursing woman okay now uh, while abu hanifa abu abu ubaid and abu thawr they say they only fast and they are not obliged to feed the needy so i only talked about why they differ because how they look at the hukum right now i'm talking about giving the names to those uh, those rulings is it making sense okay now uh, imam shafi said they perform qada and feed the needy so they do both okay and uh, uh, the pregnant woman performs the qada but does not feed the needy while the wet nurse performs the qada as well 
feeds the needy. There's another opinion that exists. Because the reason here is this, and I'm not sure how, uh, how much it exists today that the wet nurse is different than the mother. Nowadays, it's pretty much, I think, except probably there's some villages and stuff, people do that. But in general, uh, the mother is the one who is nursing the baby. So if that's because the thing is, it is not obligatory on the mother to do that. Because if she, some woman can be hired and she's doing the job, then it becomes on that. So the rule applies on her, not the mother. That's, that's the only thing. It's not really a fourth opinion. You take this and apply on uh, the, the first three that I talked about. Make sense? It's just distinguishing mother and the wet nurse. If wet nurse is the one nursing the kid, obviously mother cannot say, I'm not going to fast because uh, <laughs> my kid is being nursed. She's not the one who's nursing. That's what I'm trying to say here. Who's nursing? That's why the concept is nursing woman, not nursing mother. Okay. The, okay. Can you expand a little bit on um, the concept of fidia and uh, is there a preference versus uh, making it the fast or, you know, the payments and stuff like that? So fidia is a day meal we're talking about. And the fuqaha, they say the meal is that you regularly eat, number one thing, right? You're not expected of higher value or lower value. So you don't go like this, that you probably eat 10 or $15 per meal. But when it comes to the fidya, you're looking for a dollar, dollar meal for the, <laughs> for the person. Yeah. So what you eat, what your normal meal is, it doesn't have to be, could be a person is eating, for example, a $20 meal or $100 meal once in a while, does not necessarily mean that the fidya has to be now hundreds or hundreds of dollars. It's the normal, which, is the, which goes by the orf. Whatever the orf is for you, that what kind of food you eat, you go by this. So that's the fidya. And you talk about a one-day meal for a person for one fast. Okay. Is there a preference of paying the fidya or, uh, you know, fasting, making up the fast? Is there a preference? No, as I said, the issue is we are talking about, again, it goes back to the different schools of thoughts. So if the school of thought is talking about both feeding the needy and uh, fasting, then fidya is uh, on you as well, as, uh, and so is the fasting. If it's saying only feeding, then it's feeding. Then you know what the feeding is, the fidya is. And if it's saying uh, only for fasting, then there's no issue of fidya. Now, look, in general, if your person wants to give the fidya or, or feed the poor, that's a separate issue. You can do that anyways. Uh, but this is we're talking about as a, as a compensation, if you want to call it, or recom a compensation for what you have missed or kafara. Right? So, so I think um, we started discussing about the siding, but and we're talking about how calculation is not a not a valid opinion, whereas citing is the valid opinion. Yes. But we still haven't differentiated between uh, reconciling local versus global. What does global really mean? Is it just where you're at in terms of your locale or the nation, the mm. areas around you? And uh, how to deal with uh, differences with, within the family if sometimes there's a conflict that happens when it comes to the day of fasting or day of eat, right? So, uh, can you kind of comment on some of those? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question, but it's a, um, it, it's a loaded question. <laughs> it has a lot of angles. And um, yesterday I gave a talk on the subject. I went on for about 50 minutes, and I know that I did not cover everything. But um, still, let's break it down, the, the question that you're asking. Uh, first part is, I think that they, it has a lot of questions to even give the answer to the question you're asking. First, the question part of it is, okay, first of all, what is global sighting? Then the question comes in, what is local sighting? And which one is preferred, right? So which, or which one is the, the strongest opinion among these two? Then the, question, the third question comes, the fourth question comes in is, okay, fine. We know what the local sighting is, what the global sighting is, and uh, which is the strongest opinion now, but people are following different opinions, how to deal with that. So there are at least four questions hidden in there, right? <laughs> so it's not one question. So when it comes to a global sighting, or it's called uh, it's called wahdatul uh, mata'li. Mata'li is wahda uh, means uh, uh, oneness of the sighting, meaning one sighting is sufficient for 
the whole world, the whole globe. We are not talking about one city or one country or one continent, rather. We are talking about the whole world is included in it. So anywhere moon is sighted, that will be considered as a sighting for everyone. That's a global sighting. So that's a definition wise. Now, when it comes to local sighting, which is ikhtilaf wa mata'ala, now in this case, it is there, there's actually three different categories within them. One says, if the sighting is done in a city or, uh, or, or a qasba or one small know, village or something, that is only for them. Okay, within the local, I'm talking about there are three opinions here. So that's all, that's that. Second is, well, that's, uh, uh, that's okay for, if it's sighted in one city, then it's good for the adjacent city, but not, not further than that. Okay, so that's second. Now the third one says, it is good for one land, but not for the far lands. So east is not sufficient for the west, for example. Or for example, if you want to take, uh, uh, let's say go uh, the country-wise, for example, if you take uh, um, uh, 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 Indonesia, Indonesia is not sufficient for Pakistan, for example, because these are too far, far lands from each other, right? So it's about a couple of thousand miles away from each other. So hence they say, okay, these are the ones we cannot take it. Or the ones who do not share the part of the night, then they will be considered as, they, they have to have two different sightings. Okay? This is how they have done it. Now, that's what the, this is how the fuqaha talked about local sighting in the past, by the way. Now today, so th I think the first two questions are, give, uh, are clear, right? Um, and I'll, I will talk about a little bit about the, the evidences as well, if the time permits, uh, let me keep track of time also. So now, uh, other part of that here is, today when people talk about sighting, they have gone beyond all three of them what has been mentioned here. Because they are talking about sighting based on site pico borders have been defined among the Ummah. So Pakistan will say, for example, Pakistan would have said prior to 1947, when Pakistan and India were split into two nations, there was one moon for India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh because it was one land. After 1947, it was divided into two pieces of lands. So one was, well, actually there were three, but they called it two. One was Pakistan and one was India. But Pakistan itself was, divide, uh, was actually, uh, there were two pieces of land. One was East Pakistan, one was West Pakistan, and they were separated by about 1,000 miles. Okay, probably more than 1,000 miles. Now, so that stays as, okay, Pakistan is one country, even though they are far apart, but they will side by, they, they go by one, one sighting. Now after 1971, Pakistan, East and West divided into two further countries. One became Bangladesh, one became Pakistan. Yeah, so East Pakistan became Bangladesh, West Pakistan continued to be Pakistan. So now there are three moons. And God forbid, if we continue to divide more and more, we got to continue to have more and more different sightings and different Eids and different month, uh, the, the way the months are starting in different places. So th that's considered, unfortunately, that people are considering as, as local sighting. For, even, for example, United States, now people when talk about local sighting, they started off with, uh, within within United States, and now they're expanding it to bringing in uh, uh, Central America and bringing in some of the South America and stuff like that. But uh, see, th that's kind of a strange way of saying this is our local sighting. You either have a local sighting at one time you define it, this is our local sighting, or you don't have local sighting. You cannot have the uh, the is exp your borders are expanding for local sighting, right? Um, so that's about that. Now. Also about the problem with the local sighting is that just from the, from the scientific perspective even, if you talk about local sighting like this, you say, well, okay, uh, let, let's consider United States. So maybe easier for the people here to, to comprehend. If you consider United States, states are countries, right? So now states are countries and you say, well, each state will have their own sighting as this is what we're talking about Muslim lands anyways. So now uh, if each, each state will have their own uh, uh, sighting, so, okay, so Wisconsin sees the moon. You say, well, this is not sufficient for Illinois because Wisconsin is north of or north, northwest of, uh, of Illinois. Hence, that's not sufficient 
But at the same time, uh, even if it's seen at the border of Wisconsin, what is the first city over the Kenosha, for example? You said that's sufficient for uh, Madison, which is a couple of hundred miles away from Kenosha. But at the same time, it's not enough for Waukegan, which is a few miles next to it. So that's kind of a dumb. So if you say that's good for that, and if you say, no, 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 it's good for the neighbors also. Well, okay, if it's neighbors, it's good for them. Then okay, Wisconsin is good and Illinois is good. Well, why not the neighbor of uh, Illinois, which is Indiana as well? And then, well, if it's, there's a Ramadan in Indiana, why not go further and include Kentucky as well? Why not include Tennessee as well? And why not include Georgia as well? And on and on and on. So you would see that everything is connected. So hence, they should have one sighting anyways. So this is why another reason is wrong. That's, so this is, but for us, from the hukum perspective, we don't go by that from the aql. We have to look at what the shara says. And the fuqaha that use that, uh, they use one of the hadith, which is referred as the hadith of Quraib. Okay? The hadith, or the hadith of Ibn Abbas also. But Quraib is the one who is reporting this hadith and, uh, from Ibn Abbas. I mean, this is a conversation happening between Quraib and Ibn Abbas, actually. So Quraib was sent to, uh, actually, the mother of Ibn Abbas, Umm al-Fadl. She's the one who sent him to Sham, which is... Uh, and when we say Sham also, this is an interesting part of it. Unfortunately, whenever we say Sham, we always think of, oh, we talk about Syria. It's not necessarily Syria. Because Sham meant, today, four, four countries are included in, in the Sham, which is Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Palestine. All four nations used to come, made, uh, made, made, made Sham. So when we say Sham, Sham is not necessarily that. Sham meant the whole thing. But anyways, so she sent him to, to uh, Muawiyah, and he, got, he got, got his work done over there. And when he reached there, it was uh, at, right after that, when he was done with it, was the month of Ramadan started. And when he came back, so they, they saw the moon on the beginning, uh, they saw the, the moon of the Friday night. So when he came back, Quraid, Ibn Abbas saw him, and he asked him, when did you see the moon? And Ibn Abbas, is, uh, the Quraid's response was, we saw the moon on the Friday night. Then uh, Abbas said, but we saw the moon on Saturday night, and we're going to continue our, uh, our fasting on uh, either 30 days or we see the moon. And upon that, Quraid said, that we saw the moon there, isn't the, 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 the sighting and the fasting of Muawiyah sufficient for you? And he said, Rasulullah ordered us to, uh, to do this, uh, to act like that. Now, here the thing that people do not understand is this is not a hadith of Rasulullah. And this is why Imam Shafi, oh no, Imam Shafi, I'm sorry, Imam Hanbal. Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, all of them, they did not accept this as, a, as an evidence to be used for sighting because, uh, uh, for, for local sighting. Because the other hadith are very clear regarding the subject of that the global sighting has to be done. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Okay, now going to the, the hadith back, about the, the hadith which is about the Quraib and Ibn Abbas. Now, this is not a hadith I'm saying. This is an understanding of Ibn Abbas regarding the command. Okay? And in this, there's actually a Q&A happened between Abbas and uh, Quraib. Abbas specifically asked him in one of the hadiths which was reported by Muslim, did you see the moon to Quraib? Okay? And Quraib said, yes. I saw the moon and the people saw the moon and we fasted and uh, 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 people fasted and Muawiyah fasted. Okay. Now, the, the similar hadith is reported by Imam Tirmidhi as well. In that hadith, when Abbas, uh, Ibn Abbas asked Quraib, did you see the moon? And he did not include himself. He said, people saw the moon. And people fasted and Muawiyah fasted. Okay. So there are two aspects here. One, it is not a hadith, number one thing. It is an understanding of a sahabi, Ibn Abbas. And that cannot trump the hadith. Okay? You cannot take that and say, we can put the hadith on the side. You cannot do a tarjih of opinion of a sahabi over the hadith or the sayings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Right? And the other thing is, within the, those narrations, 
One of the narrations that you talk about is not Quraib who saw the moon. And if that's the case, Ibn Abbas cannot take, or, uh, cannot take Quraib's witness because he's not a shahid, he's a mukhbir now. He's a reporter. He's bringing the news. He is not the one who is a witness. That's one. Others, the fuqaha, including Malik and Shafi'i, uh, they actually asked for two witnesses for citing. So now, you need two witnesses for, for that, and Quraib was only one. So they think it from the angle that this cannot be taken as an evidence for, uh, for the moon sighting. But besides that, that, is, that should be sufficient for us to say, look at this, that this is not a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, rather it's an understanding of a Sahabi. And understanding of a Sahabi can be looked at as the max is, this is an ishtihad of a Sahabi. It's a ishtihad of a Sahabi. It's not the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then within those hadith, we see that Quraib is not even the witness. So there's another problem that we can see over there. Okay, that's that. Now, another angle the fuqaha discuss here is this. That when Ibn Abbas is asking the question about the sighting there, why is he interested in sighting of Sham if he is in Medina? He didn't have to ask this question if there is no issue of one sighting is sufficient for all. But he is rejecting the sighting here, Ibn Abbas. Not that he is saying that we, uh, we are supposed to be fasting, each area should be fasting their own, or have their own sighting. This is not what has been said anywhere. None of the hadith, whether Ibn Abbas one or the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu defines that, oh, different areas will have their different sighting, or there's an area, or there's a distance between different, different regions will be considered as a sighting for this region and other region. None of them say this. Now, all of them talk about that you see the moon and you fast. Now, having said all this, let me just go over Four opinions, so because all the time people talk about the, uh, the four a'imna, right? The, the, so Imam Abu Hanifa's uh, understanding about that is he says, uh, one of the understandings is mentioned about him is local sighting, sighting before or after Zawal. So talking about daytime, okay? He says both of them are ghair mu'tabar. Ghair mu'tabar means they are not considered, they're not acceptable. So local sighting is not acceptable. And he's saying before and after, and then he says, people of the East are obliged by the sighting of the West when the sighting is proved by obliged method with two witness. Okay? So he's saying East or West, wherever you see the moon, that's on both of them, vice versa. Okay? Now, Maliki says, Maliki school says, in Maliki school, if the crescent or the Hilal is sighted, fasting is for the rest of the region, near or far, doesn't matter. Okay, does not take into account the distance of Qasr, for example, shortening of the Salah, nothing. It doesn't matter. Nor the agreement of the sighting or the absence of it. It doesn't matter. You're talking about seen or not seen. Okay, that fasting is obligatory for everyone transmitted to it. Doesn't matter who saw or did not saw. As long as you've got the report that has been cited, it's obliged on you now to fast. Now, it is said, if it's said, if it's proof is transmitted by the testimony of two just people, uh, and by an extensive group, if, if, it's, if it's clear sky, then it has to be from an extensive group or a, a wide spectrum. Okay, that's about Maliki. Now, when it comes to Shafi'i, Shafi'i is the one who talks about the local sighting, by the way. Shafi said, by the way, among the Shafi'i, among those in uh, Shafi'i school of thought as well, there are scholars who went along with the global sighting as well. So let's not think of it, all the Shafi'i uh, scholars are saying this, but in general, the Shafi'i school of thought says if the crescent is Cited in a country or land, uh, uh, it's talking about use the, the, the uh, or a ballad, its rule is necessary for, the, for that land that is near, not far. Okay, according to the difference of science. See, none of them is talking about the way we think. Even, even Muawiyah, uh, uh, the, the discussion between Quraib and Ibn Abbas, they're not saying, as a matter of fact, they both were in the same country. Same Islamic State was there, and they were talking within the Islamic State, they're considering this, oh, okay. We cannot accept yours. He's not talking about the, it's the issue of distance anymore. It's a different issue going on about the issue of whether one witness can be accepted or not. Okay, now, 
Hanbali says, the school of thought, if the sighting of a crescent is confirmed in a place near or far, all people are obliged to fast, and ruling on those who did not see it, uh, see, uh, it, uh, see, it is the ruling on those who saw it. Again, same thing. So these are the four schools of thoughts that they say about this. Uh, and now, the last part of it, the question was regarding within the family, if different people are following different things. Look, um, one thing to understand, first of all, about the uh, global sighting and the local sighting. Local sighting is an opinion. If a person is following the ishtihad of Ibn Abbas, from my understanding, it is a weak opinion because it is contradicting to many of the hadith, but we are saying there's a benefit of doubt here. What Ibn Abbas is understanding here, he's saying that I'm under Rasulullah that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded us to do this way, and he was doing that way. Now, that's that, which uh, then we have to go back to again, look into more details of that, what it's about. But uh, uh, when, when we are talking about, if somebody is following it from this understanding that this is a hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a weak understanding, but for him, he looked at it as this is strong. It comes out to be strong for him. Whatever reason, he comes out strong for him. Then he is following a hukum shari here. Now, other person, for him, it is a hukum shari that if he concludes and understands that global sighting is the way to go, then he cannot pick and choose. He has to follow that. Now, the question comes in is, what do we do now? Unfortunately, the, the situation we are in, we will get stuck in this. Islam teaches us how to take care of these kind of differences. Yeah? Like the, the qaida, one of the principles that says, Amr al-Imam, yarfu al-Khilaf. That the command of the Imam raises, takes away the differences. Meaning, if the Imam or the Khalifa or the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam, not the Imam of the Masjid, we're talking about uh, the one who's ruling over the Muslims by the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. If he adopts one opinion, then it's a must for all to follow because Amr al Imam nafir zahiran wa batinun. That Imam's the command has to be followed in privacy and op uh, openly or pri and in privacy. So, unfortunately, because of that missing thing, we cannot force anybody to follow our opinions. So this is an act of ibadah. If a person is following uh, local sighting, that's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially, but if he understands that this is a wrong opinion, then it's a must for him to follow the global sighting then. The moment you conclude that the other one was weak, and this is a stronger one, then that opinion is not valid for you to follow anymore. You cannot just stick with it because my family is following, so I'm following it. You have to follow which is a right opinion, which is a stronger opinion that you concluded, or you believe the people because you, let's say you don't have the capability of uh, analyzing or weighing the opinions, then you are following somebody that you believe that he has the capability and I, I believe that he is giving the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa then you follow him. And I just follow my local masjid? Is it my responsibility to figure out if the moon has a tail So the question is, can I just follow my local masjid and my responsibility to figure all this out? And that kind of uh, lines up with a uh, question that I had. It's, uh, you know, will uh, somebody ask, will I be accountable for this? And this kind of ties into the last thing you can make. Um, or is this going to the responsibility going to fall on the committee, for example, whatever the local community? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, let's be clear. First of all, uh, masjid is a very broad term. Masjid is walls and the, and the roof and the ceiling and, and, and the carpet. Obviously, nobody's falling back. Right? It's more of what we're talking about an understanding coming from certain people who are in the masjid. So if you're talking about that, then we will go by, okay, are you talking about a scholarly opinion or the one who is explaining to you what is the ruling? For example, you are ended up with a person who does not know how to evaluate the rulings, right? And you are following a person that you believe, or an alim, that you believe that he can explain to you that which one is the opinion to be followed. See, you're talking about here the issue of taqlid here, because the person is doing the taqlid because he does not know how to distinguish between the opinions here, right? And now you are following somebody that you believe is 
as the one who has the understanding to comprehend what is the strong opinion and what is a weak opinion. And now you are ending up with following a person. Okay? So it's not a masjid. There's no such thing called following a masjid, by the way. Okay? It's the issue is you follow the hukum shari. Now, where do you get the hukum shari is the idea now. Are you the one who has the capability? Are you the one to extract the ruling, understand the ruling, or are you dependent on others to explain to you what is the ruling? And in that case, you will end up, uh, and again, there are different variations, which category you fall under. But at the end of the day, you have to follow the hukum shari, meaning you have to know what is the opinion about the subject and what are the evidences, and then you follow the opinion, not a masjid, because uh, a lot of time, the opinions are coming out of the masjid and they are not even they have anything to do, they are not even opinions of Islam even sometimes. Like for example, when we're talking about calculations is coming out of the masajid, the masajid so calculation is forbidden in that case from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you cannot say my masjid is following it, hence I am following it. If it is not even a valid opinion in Islam, you cannot follow it. So you cannot just blame the masjid and thinking of the, your neck is off the hook, no. So we are all accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me be, repeat that clearly. When we talk about the, when somebody comes up and say they've been following the masjid, I want to be very clear about that, that we don't follow a masjid. As a, let me start again. Masjid is walls, <laughs> the walls, ceilings, and, and, and the ground, and the carpets, whatever the, the things are here, that's called masjid. So masjid does not produce opinions. We talk about when you, when you, when you say masjid, you meant there are people in the masjid, they have adopted an opinion and they are giving you the opinion that, okay, this masjid is announcing that Ramadan starts at that time. Now, what is the Shari ruling about that part? That's the, I think that's a valid question, right? Now, this is, we have to look at from the angle of, when we have to follow, when a person has to follow, he is bound by Hukum Shari. He has to know the rule of Allah Azza wa Jal about an action. What does Allah wants from the Shari? The, the legislator, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he want from us for any action? Not only citing, any action. And to do that, you go back to the sources of Islam and extract the rules. Now, who is the one who extracts the rules? The person who has, a, uh, who has the capability of extracting the rules, which are called mujtahideen. Okay? So mujtahideen are the one, or jurists, Islamic jurists, they extract the rule, and they can tell us what is the ruling on this subject, for example, in the subject of sighting of the moon. Now, we talked about the four aima. These were jurists also. Their opinions were there. Now, global sighting or local sighting or so ever. Now, if they are talking about going by these opinions, then they better be going by these opinions then. Not by the borders created among us and calling that this is the opinion of Imam Shafi. That's not Imam Shafi was talking about. And this is not the way the local sighting was ever discussed. So it has to be discussed the way that they discuss them. Number one thing. Now, if the masjid is saying we are following specifically like this, or we are following the global sighting because of the, 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 this is opinion here, that Islam talks about that. Then we can follow that. The, you're not following the masjid still. You are following the opinion of Islam, the shari opinion you are following. Okay? And you have to follow the opinion not based on my masjid, you have to know what they are talking about is valid or not, whether it's the strongest one or not. Do you really trust that this is the right opinion to follow? Then you follow the opinion, not based on coming from my masjid, other masajid, or group of masajid, or majority of the masajid. Rules are never looked at from that angle. Rules are always looked at as from the perspective of they are hukum shari, which is which one is the stronger one, and you follow that. Did that clarify that? Okay. Does this differ from uh, following the masjid, for example? I mean, you already clear about it. Does this differ from like a committee, for example, like a hilal committee or something like that? So, councils, um, a hilal committee or shura or majority of the people. Look, Islam, when we talk about the rules in Islam, uh, 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 when we talk about the ahkam sharia, when we talk about that, they are legislated by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who gives the rules. We are bound to follow that. It's not the issue of what the majority agrees on or the minority uh, agrees on, or what is the, in the benefit of the ummah. Uh, you don't look at from the action of 
Halal and haram do not come from that angle. Halal and haram comes from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Okay? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited something, that is considered haram. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who allowed something, that is the halal thing, right? So in this case as well, uh, it's not the council, it's not the majority of the people, even majority of the shuyu, you, you don't go by that. You go by the evidences that they're presenting, and you look at by, from the perspective of the evidences if this is a Sharia opinion or not. That council or uh, number of people does not make a rule a Sharia opinion. Yes. So um, the local sighting and global sighting issue exists among the Ummah, and uh, we are talking about more of uh, how to unite. Unfortunately, um, people think of it as if the calculation is a way to unite the Ummah. While calculation is prohibited, while we are giving the solution from the Shara, which is from the strongest opinion uh, uh, from the ayat and the hadith that, that talks about that, that this is a way to go for, and that can bring the unity of the Ummah. And then uh, to say that this is causing this disunity, it's a, a kind of a strange thing to say anyways. So we are talking about, so we are giving the solution of uniting, not the families only, but at large the whole Ummah. And uh, we can all be united. And, and, uh, and this can only be done. And for, there's an aspect missing that that's why we are in this mess. We really have to understand this and digest it and work for this cause so we can bring the unity in the ummah, not only for moon sighting, but all the things which are happening around, which can only be done with under the khilafah when the khalifa is there and that can bring the, uh, the, the ummah together. And uh, including this aspect of it. Yes. Uh, yeah. For the ruksa for someone that's sick, mm -hmm. um, does this mean that sickness is present on that person? Therefore, you know they have an excuse for it. Is it that you know there's a probability that probably that they will be sick if it's that? Is that a valid understanding? It's not the probability. It's the issue of a person is sick. See, this this is why. Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. You are the, this is your job, man. Could you repeat the question? Yes. <laughs> so the question is, uh, for the excuse of sickness, is it that sickness must be present at that moment? Or is it that, you know, there's a probability of sickness occurring if you fast? For example, you know, some people say maybe I have a condition of headaches, right? Like if I fast, I'll get, I'll get a really, really bad headache. Is that is that valid, or is it, or must the sickness be present in order for the excuse to be? So okay, so the question is two parts. Is that specific uh, um, instance valid, like the probability of sickness, and, and more generally, what are the uh, conditions for the excuse to be present? Yeah, so uh, the thing goes back to, uh, and I am uh, I'm familiar with some of the people who have things like this, for example, the migraine that happens, or some people who are diabetic, um, uh, like they, they, they will collapse, they probably need some sugar intake or something, uh, what's it called, hyperglycemic or something, not the hypo, hyper, right, so in that case, uh, uh, they are aware of their condition, whenever they, if they do not eat for a certain period of time, for example, or they don't have some sort of food or medication. This is what happens to them. They're aware of this, it happens all the time. This is, uh, this is why the, you distinguish between the sicknesses, which is called uh, a sickness, which is a permanent kind of sickness that exists among the people, or there's something that is temporarily happens to the people, right? So the one who have a permanent one, actually for the solution for them is the fidya. They cannot even fast. It's not the issue of uh, only month of Ramadan. They cannot even fast at all. And the same thing, they, they fall under a similar category as old people. That old people, they do not have the capability. So when you talk about this kind of a sickness, that's a permanent condition in a person that he does not have the capability of fasting. So he will fall under that, that category. Now, if you're talking about just uh, uh, fixation of the, uh, some sort of a, uh, a mental thing that he thinks, he assumes he may get sick, that's a separation, right? You're talking about permanent conditions are different. Then, for example, uh, I feel like I, I may get cold today, so I'm not going to fast. This is not considered as uh, a, a, a real, real condition. So you have to be sick for that to, to have the order. And at the end, it's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You, know you know your situation better. Anyone who is uh, in that kind of situation. That kind of ties into a second follow-up question, which would be like, in a situation like that, 
Uh, for example, somebody is developing a migraine and it's not actually a migraine yet, uh, but they feel like chances are it's probably going to become one. Would it be better for them to not fast? And would that be worse than fasting and then having to break it? Or would it be worse to, or would it be better to just... See, again, it goes back to the situation of we are talking about is it a permanent condition we're talking about a person has or is it comes and go. So if that's the case, then if a person is not sure if he is going to get sick or something, then he can fast and then take the medication and it's allowed to break the fast in the cases where you are not able to do something. You're not able to continue the fast also. In that case, then you have to... And then uh, do you just pay the fee? Yeah. It depends. See, again, it goes back to the issue of are we talking about this is a temporary condition or a permanent situation? If it's a permanent situation, then you end up with the with the fidia. Yeah, so we have this thing that's kind of kind of prevalent in the society where parents kind of uh, kind of smother their children and tell them, oh, don't fast today, you know, don't go to the letter or something. Or you know, you have an exam when you got school, we fast on the weekends. Um, so uh, the brother's question is like, how do you address this? And my question uh, would be in those situations that do occur, what is Basically, like obviously, you know, they should change the habit, but uh, does that mean they're making up those fast, or are they going not? Is it worse? What's the punishment for that? Up to us, you know, in this world, not on the other drugs. So, um, uh, obviously, in this world, when you talk about what do they have to do to make up for that? Oh, that's not a punishment. Okay, so you're talking about the kafara here. Okay. Um, number one thing is, uh, obviously, when we are talking about that, we're talking about the children who are, who are, um, uh, who are adults, meaning uh, it is an obligation on them to fast, right? We're not talking about kids who have not hit the puberty. Is that a correct assumption in my question, yes. in your question? Uh, I am talking about post-puberty, right? Which is, mean it is obligatory on those children to fast. They are not children, really. Now they're adults. So, but they are under the guardianship of the parents and the parents are about taking care of it. Now, they think of it, okay, well, he, the kid is 13, 14, uh, he has hit the puberty, but it is better for him not to fast so that he can do better in the exams or, or his uh, extracurricular activities, including sports and whatsoever. Now, uh, look, uh, obligation is an obligation. There is, whereas we don't have any ruhsa for these specific kind of things. Uh, ruhsa comes from uh, again, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Jazakallah khair. So, <clears throat> when we talk about the rukhsa, the rukhsa has to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't make up the rukhsa or the, uh, um, what's the word for rukhsa? Permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that, uh, there, there's no permissibility given in those cases, so we cannot make it up. Now, what, what would be the, uh, how, how do we deal with these kind of parents, right? So number one, uh, those kids have to understand that they are accountable now. It's the, uh, for their specific things, they are accountable that they have to fast even if they are, their parents are forcing them not to fast because this is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Uh, and th that's one aspect of it. Now, the parents, uh, the, the people who are around them, or even if the child himself, I'm not sure if the word child is the right word to say, but that you, young man or young woman uh, uh, they have to talk to their parents to remind them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reason that we fast is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to, to, to uh, be accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hence we, they should be allowed to be fasting. Uh, and what, what is more important here is to be successful in the akhirah uh, not for the things that we think of the real, of course all these things need to be done. People have to go to school, they have to be doing all those activity depending on what we are talking about, but it cannot be at the stake of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be within the realm, within the boundaries Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. And if Allah allows it, that's fine. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not allow it, that cannot be done. And in this case, obviously, the situation that you are bringing it up, the, the, those young men, women, they have to fast. And of course, they are capable, we are talking about, and they, it is an obligation on them. So from somebody who's around the parents and can just talk to them, talk to them and remind them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the things, the key thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about fasting, perhaps you gain the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those parents have to be reminded of that as well. What would be the kafara? What would be the kafara for that? 
You have to fast. You cannot just not fast for no reason. You have to fast. If somebody force feeding you, I'm not sure that's the case. <laughs> that, that's a different story. Of, uh, then still, you, 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 you fast when you, if you're able to. You make it up. So, like for the youth, well, like for example, if you have somebody in the family that kind of has that habit, and, uh, you convince them, what would they do for the rest of that month? Like after the after Ramadan is over, would they just make up all those days, whatever days? Or? I mean, look, we are talking about we're not talking about somebody is forcing the food in somebody's mouth. We're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the, that's, a, that's a separate issue okay. completely, and I don't think that's any of the scenario here to go into people are forcing food in the mouth of these young kids. Unless you're talking about Uyghur Muslims, for example, unfortunately, that's a situation that they are forcing the food in their mouths. That's, that's a completely separate thing, though, than the youth, yeah. yeah it's, okay, so the question is, if a person, uh, uh, he has not fasted because of he was under the impression that parents have told him not to fast, hence he's not fasting, and then once you uh, talk to him and convince him, now he starts fasting, what do you do with the rest of the fast that he missed because of the mistake? So this is, again, because of uh, ignorance uh, from his end that he did not fast. Hence, he has to take care of the things that he has missed here. Yeah. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we are talking about, I want to make sure, we are talking about adult kids here. The one who have hit the puberty is an obligation on them to fast. We are not talking about small children. Uh, the question from the sisters is, when exactly do we stop eating Sephora? Is it when the adult starts or finishes? So um, the, 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 it goes back to uh, the, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not, the, not necessarily the Adan itself per se. It's the issue of the timing. The timing is when the Fajr starts. Fajr starts meaning when the, the black thread of the night can be distinguished from the white thread of the day. Not talking about black and white threads, as one of Sahabi made the mistake of he was sleeping with white thread and breath under his pillow too. When he can distinguish between those two, then he will stop eating. That's not, Rasulullah was smiling at him also when he heard the story. It's, it's more of the black thread is referred to the nighttime and the, the, when the Fajr, as we know what the Fajr is, when the first spark is coming out, that's considered as a Fajr. And uh, uh, so the, the, that's where you say, okay, this is where you stop. Now, and then, uh, as even the time of Rasulullah uh, Abdullah ibn Maktoum, he used to give the adhan way before uh, the time of the Fajr. And Rasulullah Sallallahu said to go by the, the, the Bilal. When he gives the adhan, it, it was more of a because of the issue of, because he's giving at the right time. And Umm Maktoum, uh, Abdullah ibn Maktoum, he, uh, he was blind. So he was giving uh, adhan before actually. And that's not considered as the time. The time is the Fajr time. Now, it's not the beginning of the adhan or end of the adhan. Unfortunately, for example, uh, I remember in Pakistan, many of the people, what they do is they take the food outside the house and start listening to the adhans and uh, li listen to the adhan until the last adhan far, far away, he can hear and uh, then he stops eating. <laughs> but that's not, it. the issue is not linked to that. It's not linked to that or the, when Allahu Akbar said, uh, uh, and you will continue to eat until Imam say, the, the, the mod then says, La ilaha illallah at the end. <laughs> it's the time, it's a timing issue. If the Fajr time is there, you stop eating. Simple as that. Go ahead. Uh, last question from the sisters. It says, if I'm traveling while I'm fasting, do I break my fast according to the local time of the place I travel to, or do I follow my hometown fast? So first to understand that the person who's traveling, it, he, he or she is allowed not to fast also. Right, so this is a ruksa here, but again the timing goes on with the, the with the sun. So you are going by the sun. So the, it's the time. The issue is sunset. If the sun sets, your day is over. You pray, you 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 break your fast at that time. So basically, wherever you are at that time, yeah. you go by sunset. Yeah. Is it possible to keep flying and not have break your fast? Well, that's why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has given the ruksa anyways. Yes. Right? Allah has given you the uh, flexibility here. And um, uh, the, 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 there's a hadith that talks about um, in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, Sahaba asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa about if they're traveling, is that okay for them to fast? Rasulullah sallallahu said, Allah has given you the ruhsa. And, uh, uh, and the Sahaba asked, is it a sin if they fast? And Rasulullah said, no, it's not. La that there is no sin on you if you, if you fast as well. 
Uh, but it's better not to in that come one of the high there's a khilaf about this whole issue also again look uh, let's not get into this whole, whole many many different opinions that exist among the fuqaha again in this issue as well but it is uh, there, there is a ruqsa if you want to practice that you can but it is allowed for you to fast as well so either way is fine okay. I have a couple here yeah. that I think are important and they're kind of more simplistic exactly. yeah they're more people I think one would be what, are, what actions actually make you fast? Like what? One intention, what unintentional actions, or even intentional actions? So when we talk about fasting, uh, let, let's understand the basic uh, definition of fasting, and then it becomes uh, easier, right? So basic definition of fasting is, let me just look for it. I mean, it's abstination of eating and drinking from the time of the Fajr until the sunset, right? And uh, also to um, not to have a sexual relationship uh, during this time as well. The, 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 it's, it says very specifically the word jima has been used, for example. So th that's not allowed. Or, uh, uh, but during this time, for example, if a person eats by mistake, by forgetfulness, it is allowed. It, it does not break the fast, you continue on. But doesn't mean that you remember and then you continue the meal also. No, you stop there. <laughs> the moment you remember, you stop there. You don't continue to eat. But if you have eaten something out of forgetfulness, that does not break the fast. That's one thing. But if you intentionally eat, intentionally drink, intentionally have sexual relationship, or you have ahtalam, um, wet dream, by, wet dream that does not break the fast, but if it is intentional, uh, then it will break the fast. Okay. And uh, so basically, like, not like if you, if you do something wrong by accident or not really by accident, but like out of forgetfulness, uh, forgetfulness out of uh, negligence, uh, such as maybe somebody like has a swear word or something like that. Look, I'm not talking about, we're not talking about, see, there's a difference between negligence and forgetfulness. Forgetfulness is you did not remember and you did an action. That one is forgiven. Negligence is. Uh, I don't. I don't think in English language negligence and forgetfulness have the same meaning. No. Negligence is something different. You are being neglectful. You know what you're doing, but you are uh, just doing it for the heck of it. Yeah. So that's of course. If it breaks the fast, it will break the fast. If it does not, then it will not. Meaning, swearing itself does not, but it can take away the the, the hasanah from you. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not uh, need uh, that kind of a fasting that you don't. Uh, eat, you don't, uh, uh, you don't eat, you don't drink, and you're not doing the sexual intercourse, but you are doing all other kind of bad deeds. You're supposed to, that's the, that's the idea behind the fasting. Again, I'm taking it back to that. So you have to get the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You become more and more careful about your action. And this is what the, the fasting is supposed to do. Look, we are always conscious that I'm not supposed to eat, I'm not supposed to drink. Why? Because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah commanded me to do that. So this is a uh, really a very good uh, way of building a person up. Yeah? It, like, for example, on a daily basis, we do that, right? I was thinking about today, actually. It's like this. On a daily basis, we do kind of a, think of it as, a, um, uh, you know, we reboot ourselves, think of this way, that f five prayers we do. We do the Fajr, the Hora, and Maghrib, Isha, and the Hadith actually discusses that can, uh, if a person who has a, uh, a river by his house and he takes shower, uh, he, he bathes five times a day, would you expect him to have any kind of a dirt or anything on him? And Sahaba said no. And this is what the prayer is supposed to be doing to us. We go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day and it, it's again and again we're going back to Allah, bowing down in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep saying Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And all, all, all different kinds of uh, thana and the, the dua and all those things we do, that should actually take us back every time. Even though between those salah, we may be pulled away, somehow we forget certain things. The more we go back to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the next salah, it's like a remembrance, a reminder again and again who we are. Because Ramadan plays a bigger role than that. So salah is five times, right? There are gaps in between. But when it comes to fasting, you are going from dawn to dusk. Is it dawn to dusk? Yeah. Dawn to dusk. Uh, that you are in this state of consciousness 
for the basic things that you always do, eat, drink, and uh, uh, you have time with the family and things like Family means talking about sexual relationship. So that, that, that's, uh, uh, we are conscious that we don't want to do all these things, right? So this consciousness is why? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that should actually really every year we are, we are completely doing, a, I'm going to call it upgrade our systems. <laughs> Isn't it? Software. The software updates, but filling all the, taking care of all the uh, bugs and stuff. You're putting all the patches over there. So that's, uh, that, that, that's a complete reboot of a person. Like that. On, on a daily basis, we probably put some, uh, it's actually a new release coming up probably. Uh, small, small patches are coming up on five times a day for us to get fixed and get, remember that, okay, we made this mistake, let's fix it. We made these mistakes, let's fix it every, after every salah. Yeah, but uh, Ramadan is a much bigger thing. But uh, I want to make sure one thing, one point to make here. When you talk about salah, when you talk about fasting, it's not the issue of uh, that we want to have this feeling of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when it comes to our actions, we are not utilizing them. The, we build ourselves up by salah, by fasting, by all the ibadat. So now when we go back to the dunya and do those things with other people, we are making sure that we are doing all those things also according to what Allah has commanded. It should not be just restricted to salah and uh, zakah and hajj and, and fasting and all those things, but utilize these things to the rest of the life as well. That's, that's like a, a more of a, a, a building ourselves up when we, when we go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we go back to the people, when interacting with them, we still remember Allah in all the cases and we act as Allah has commanded in those things as well. So the, inshallah, uh, there's no more questions here. We'll stop here. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadun la ilaha illa.